Well, good morning again, and good morning to those joining us live on, on Facebook this morning. We're delighted to have you with us. Uh, just want to say to our, our youth, I haven't forgotten about getting youth uh, started back up. Uh, unfortunately, we've had a number, a lot of sickness and a number of deaths, and, and I'll probably be involved in, in, in a couple funerals this week, but youth will get back on track just as soon as we can. I apologize uh, for for the delays, but uh, I'll, I'll be sending something out to you soon. Uh, we will be having a congregational meeting next Sunday on August 15th to, uh, to talk about the possibility of, of a, a extended a, a staff position. I won't say more about that. The, Tim and the leadership team will be presenting that. Uh, other than, than I will say, uh, folks have asked, uh, I'm not going anywhere that I know of. <laughs> You're not getting rid of me of that that easy, uh, but uh, uh, but just uh, we hope it's a chance to expand the ministry of, of Stewart Presbyterian Church, and uh, hope you'll come out and and hear about that uh, next Sunday. Uh, pretty excited about it, and uh, hope hope God's in it, that God's will be done, and in, in the whole process. But uh, anxious to share with with you all, and so be in prayer and, and come and and hear more next week. Um, don't forget, if you haven't done your photography uh, for the directory, and I'm one who hasn't, uh, so uh, I need to go down myself, but uh, please uh, go down and, and do that. Are, are we doing that every Sunday, any Sunday? Okay. Good, good point. Uh, as Sammy said, if, if you didn't catch that, you don't have to be a member of the church. If you're a part of our church and you want to come and, and be on that contact list uh, and, and have your photo made, we'd love to. Helps you, helps us get to know you. It helps you to get to know uh, us uh, as well. Um, we are uh, holding children's church, uh, so you can go down uh, afterwards. And we are trying to get Sunday school up and going. It's been a little slow. We maybe tried that too soon with, with school just starting back. But we are having Sunday school for all ages uh, on Sunday morning, so uh, please get back uh, for that. I know the class that, that uh, Beth and Kelly lead will start on the 22nd is the plan on that particular class, but all others are up and, and going. Well, let me call us to worship. Uh, if you would get out your hymnal, if you have one near, uh, with responsive reading number seven. Reading number seven. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Amen. Well, let us come in our prayers now and praise the Lord's uh, glorious name. Please pray with me. Lord, yours is the greatness and the power, and the glory, and the majesty, and the splendor. There is no one greater than you, O Lord. And there is no one more loving than you. And as we will be reminded of in our text today, you are able to do abundantly more than what we can ask or even imagine. And you do that according to the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. So Lord, we ask that you would, first of all, forgive us beyond what we deserve. Forgive us not according to our iniquity, but according to your abundant and steadfast love. 
And Lord, we're in need of you doing more than we can ask or imagine. We're in need of you healing us. Lord, you know the great division that seems to be in our land and how some seem to relish in it. Certainly Satan does. So thwart his plans. Bring healing to our nation, O Lord. Lord, you know on a personal level that we've had a lot of death in our church and community recently. Two more beloved folks this weekend, Day Williams and Lucille Kirk. And we ask, O Lord, that you come and heal those families and and all of the families who have recently lost loved ones. Lord, we're hurting. We're grieving. Send your Holy Spirit to be our comforter. Lord, others in our community are dealing with with end-of-life issues and the care of aging parents. Some among us are those aging parents, and we're struggling with all the changes that come with age. Some are battling COVID. Others are dealing with perhaps bad knees or bad hips, or maybe something worse like cancer. We pray, O God, that you would come and you would be our healer. We pray that you would pour out your love upon us and that we would experience, even in these trying times, the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of your love. We ask all this in Jesus' name, in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and join us in singing, Great Are You, Lord. You give life, you are love.
Great is the Lord indeed. Amen. Thank you. Will the children come forward for a time that's especially for you? Get my Bible open to the passage we're looking at. Does anybody have any idea what this is? Oh, what's that? A toy? Yeah, it could be. You guys want to feel the weight of it? It's pretty heavy. We'll be very careful. You got it? It's pretty heavy, you know, see? Not heavy to you? Yeah, you're strong. Me, I'm just getting weak, but it's heavy. You know, see, it's probably dirty, actually, you guys. I probably shouldn't be passing it around, come to think of it. But it's, it's heavy. In the bucket? I'll tell you in just a minute. I figured you might be curious about that. Uh, this is a magnet. This is actually a big magnet. Does anybody know what a magnet does? What does it do, actually? Okay, it sticks to metal. It draws metal to itself, right? Yeah. You're right. You're right. Some kind, kinds of metal, it won't. So, uh, in this bucket, is some metal, and I'll show you how this magnet's pretty strong. See all the nails it picked up? Hope one didn't go shooting over there. I'll have to look. This is a pretty strong magnet. I actually used it uh, when the roofers put the roof on my shed. I drug it around the outside of the shed to get up all the nails, and it picked up like 100 nails or so out of the grass and, uh, and the gravel. It really was that many. They didn't police the area very well. But it was a whole lot better to pick them up with that magnet than to pick them up with my tires on my lawnmower or my car, right? The magnet was really helpful. It like, like Axon said, the, uh, a magnet draws metal to itself. And I was thinking this morning about how Jesus drew people to himself, how people were pulled almost like a magnet to Jesus. wonder why they were drawn to Jesus. You have, guys have any idea why, why people were drawn to Jesus? What do you think, Wesley? Okay, because they loved him so much. Did somebody else have a hand up? Was that, did that take your answer? Would you have another answer, Axon? What do you think? Because Jesus was kind to them? Yeah, good answer. Good answers. Both of those are great answers. Yeah, people were drawn to Jesus because he loved people. He, you know, the Bible tells us that, that he gathered children like you guys all around him, and, and they were drawn to him and wanted to hear his stories and hear his teaching. Uh, the Bible tells us other times that the great crowds came around Jesus, and he taught them, and he, he even fed them a few times. The Bible says one time he fed more than 5,000 people. And another time he fed more than 4,000. So. You're absolutely right. A little boy gave him his lunch and he shared it and prayed over it. And God, a great miracle. And uh, he was able to feed everybody. Yeah, awesome. You're right. Uh, was, it was just fish and bread, but Jesus fed a whole bunch of people. Fish and chips, so to speak. And he fed a whole bunch of people. Yeah. 
That's an awesome story. Thank you for reminding me of that one. That's, that's wonderful. So I was thinking, if Jesus drew people to himself by his love, that maybe you and I should show the love of Jesus to people, not so much to draw them to ourselves, but to draw them to Jesus. That when we love people uh, and are kind to people, then they learn about Jesus. Uh, maybe even we could share food with someone, or you could go to someone's house uh, and help them. Can you think of any other ways we can be kind to someone and love them? Action, you got an idea? What's that? Be respectful? That's a good answer. Wesley? Play with them? That's a good one, yeah. Sometimes people are lonely and they need somebody to play with, but both good. Anybody else? How we can be show the love of Jesus? You don't have to speak if you don't want to. Well, I think that's what we should try to do. We should try to show the love of Jesus to draw people unto Jesus. So would you guys pray with me? And we'll just ask Jesus to help us do that, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, help us love the way Jesus loved. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. You have a great week, and go out and love people like Jesus loved, okay? While we give Jeanette a minute, I want to tell you, this is a song that many of you have requested before, and it just took us a long time to get to it. But it has some great lyrics, and I know some of you know it already, so... Please don't be shy if you'd like to sing along with me today. Reckless Love.
Thank you, praise team. And I pray that um, all of you know that overwhelming love of God, that love of God, that reckless love of God that pursued you, uh, that would not let you go until you said yes uh, to His grace and His mercy. And uh, I, I just hope you, uh, as we talk about that more today, you just get more and more a sense of just how much uh, the Lord loves you. Uh, he deeply loves you, folks. He delights uh, in you as His beloved. Please know that. Well, let's pray together. Lord, when I hear a song like that, I, I can't help but think of my own life and how far I strayed when you can't come running after me. When you would not let me go. And Lord, others of us could tell of that. We could, we could tell of uh, maybe we didn't even know you at all when you came running after me. Uh, so maybe we, we grew up in church, but we were running away from you, and, but you came running after us. Lord, we're just so grateful. We thank you for your great, great love. And Lord, though there's no way I, I can do it justice or, or explain it completely because you have to experience that great love, I pray that we'll get a deeper sense of it today, that you'll just take us deeper into your great love and that that great love would then allow us to love you more and to love others more. So send your spirit again today to guide the reading of your holy word, to open our ears and our hearts to hear it and to apply it to our daily living. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, I'm reading from Ephesians uh, 3. Uh, verses 14 to 21. Uh, we'll have it up here on the screen, or you can follow along in your Bibles. Ephesians 3, verses 14 to 21. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you be strengthened, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God." Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Well, thus far in this uh, series, uh, we've seen that Paul has offered prayers of thanksgiving. Uh, he's prayed that that God would reveal more of himself to believers. He's prayed that we would know the hope to which God has called us, that we'd know the glorious riches of our inheritance, that we would know the immeasurable greatness of God's power. Paul's prayed that we would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. He's prayed that you and I would live in a manner worthy of the Lord, live in a manner worthy of our calling. And then last week we saw that he, he prayed that you and I would be fully sanctified, that we would be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord. Now today, Paul prays for the Ephesians and in turn for us that we would be rooted and grounded in love, that we would know the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of God's great love for us in Christ. You know, the, the Ephesus church must have been a pretty good church in many ways. For Jesus says about them in Revelation 2, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, 
and you found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. The Ephesians worked for Christ. They did not tolerate false teaching. They had persevered. However, they apparently struggled with love. For Jesus continues, verse 4, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place until you repent. Jesus said they've abandoned the love they had at first. Other translation says they, they've abandoned their first love. They've lost their first love. Now, this could mean that their enthusiasm for faith had, had waned a little. Uh, they were working hard for Christ. They were rooting out evil for Christ. But perhaps they had forsaken their love for Christ. They had forsaken perhaps their relationship with Christ. This could also mean that they had forsaken their love for one another. In their effort to root out evil, in their effort to hold unswervingly to the truth, the Ephesians may have lost their love for people. They may have become suspicious, wondering who, who else among them was the false teacher, and, and so they failed to love one another while rightly hating sin they had failed to love the sinner. Either way, Paul must have also known of the Ephesians' struggle with love. And he knew that the only way for them to love more fully was to be grounded in Christ's love, to grasp the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of Christ's love. So let's look a little closer at Paul's prayer this morning. Notice our text, verse 14, begins, For this reason. Uh, when a text begins this way, we need to find out what it's referring to. What does for this reason refer to? And this is a bit technical, but uh, bear with me for a minute. Uh, if you notice, verse 1 of chapter 3 also begins, For this reason. I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. And then English translations like the ESV, the NIV, the NASB add a dash at the end of verse 1. That's because what is written in verses 2 to 13 is kind of a parenthesis, or it's a tangent that Paul goes off on. He starts out in verse 1, and he says, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. And then he goes, Oh, and by the way, uh, you, do not know, you do know about God's grace given to me and, and how I was made a minister. And though I'm less of faith than, than anyone, I'm, I'm the least among the saints. And then verse 14, he gets back on track and he says, okay, back to what I was talking about. For this reason, I bow my knees. So for this reason is a continuation of verse 1, and therefore it actually refers back to Ephesians chapter 2 where Paul says Christ makes us alive in him, that we're Christ's workmanship, that we're no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens. We're being built together, up together as a dwelling for God. In other words, in chapter 2, Paul speaks of our new and great status in Jesus. And then he says in chapter 3, for this reason, because you have this new status in Jesus, I bow my knees before the Father. Paul is praying that the Ephesians, and in turn we, would live into this new status. That we would live into the power that is given us by the Holy Spirit. And we talked about power a couple weeks ago, and we'll move more into talking about the power of the Holy Spirit in, in some weeks to come. And he's praying, our subject for today, that Christ will dwell in our hearts so that we might be rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. You see, Paul wants us to live out our new status as Christians, as Christ followers. And what do we primarily know about Jesus? And the kids hit the nail on the head. He, he's kind. He's loving. He's compassionate. He loves us, and He loves us still. 
Allow me now to go off on a bit of a tangent of my own. Notice Paul says back uh, in verse 14, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. The bowing of knees may be literal. Paul may have literally been on his knees for the Ephesians. We, we do not know. But we do know that people in the Bible use various postures when they come before the Lord. Sometimes they stood. Sometimes uh, they sat. Sometimes they bowed their knees. Uh, they were on their knees. And sometimes, quite frankly, and quite often, they spilled out before the Lord and lay on their face with their hands raised uh, in praising the Lord and confessing and so forth. But what I suggest we consider in this study on the prayers of Paul is that the bowing of knees, folks, is more than a posture. When we think about praying, we need to think about an attitude of submission, a recognition that we are in the presence of someone holy, someone with authority, someone with the capability of answering our prayers. And bowing our knees can also be a, a, a sign that, that we have great passion, that we're coming in prayer with great emotion. When Ezra, for example, learned of the Israelites intermarrying with their pagan neighbors, he was so appalled. The Bible says he was so appalled that he fell on his knees and he spread out his hands to the Lord and he confessed on behalf of the people. Beloved, what I'm saying here is prayer is serious business. And whether literally or figuratively or both, we should bow our knees before the Father. We should come with reverence and understand that it's serious business. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's an honor to come in the presence of the living God. And we should come with that kind of reverence. So I want to home in on how Paul bowed his knees and how he prayed regarding love. Let me take us back to our text again, beginning with verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. When Paul prays that we are rooted and grounded in love, he's clearly talking about Christ's love because he goes on to pray that we would know the length, the height, the depth of Christ's love. Paul prayed something similar in Philippians 1.9, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. Folks, Paul is not praying for a sentimental, sappy kind of love. Nothing wrong with it, but that's not what he's praying for. He's also not praying for a surfacy kind of love. He's praying for a love with knowledge, with discernment, with depth. In short, he's praying that you and I would have the kind of love that Jesus demonstrated. And his was love in truth, truth in love. Jesus never shied away from turning up the heat of truth. But at the same time, he always brought the warmth of compassion and love to people. I think about Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well. His great love caused Jesus, a Jew, to reach out to a Samaritan woman, which in the culture of his day, that was unheard of. A Jew did not associate with a Samaritan, and especially a Samaritan woman, at all. But Jesus not only spoke to her, he offered her living water. He offered her himself. He couldn't have loved her anymore. However, Jesus knew the truth about this woman, and he didn't gloss over it. He reminded her that she had had five husbands, and the man she was with was not her husband. Or consider Jesus' encounter with the woman caught in adultery. His love and compassion caused him to keep her from being stoned to death. He sent away her would-be accusers, her would-be executioners, by reminding them that they too had sinned. And then Jesus, the only one who had the right to punish her, 
said, neither do I condemn you. Again, amazing love. Amazing love. But he didn't stop there. He also knew that she needed the truth, and so he added, from now on, sin no more. If you want to read about these encounters more, they're in John 4 and John 8, uh, respectively. No greater love, folks, than the love of Christ. And Paul is praying that you and I would consider such great love. He's praying that you and I would comprehend Christ's great love, that we would begin to understand love in truth, truth in love. Paul's praying that we would comprehend the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of Christ's love. He's praying that you and I would ponder it. That we would go beyond mere intellectual knowledge of Christ's love, for it surpasses knowledge. Paul's praying that you and I would would realize more and more just how grand, just how great Christ's love is. That we would deeply, richly experience Christ's great love for us. You, You know, if our love is going to abound more and more, as Paul said in the Philippians, then we need a model. We need to experience the great love of Christ. You and I can't model something we've never experienced. We all know people, or perhaps we're one of those people who, who really don't know how to love because we've never really experienced true love. Some people sadly have trouble being affectionate because they, they've just never really experienced affection. Some have had sadly been so manipulated and even abused by people who claim to love them that they're suspicious of everyone who wants to love them now. They think, what does he or she want? How is this person going to hurt me again? But Paul is praying that we will know Christ's love. That we'll truly experience it. That we'll see just how amazingly different Christ's love is from all the other loves we've ever received. And how different is it? What is it like? How great is it? Well, you have to experience it to fully know it. But I really like how Max Lucado states it in the grip of grace. There Lucado ponders God's love in Christ and he writes this. Can anything make me stop loving you? God asks. Well, watch me speak your language. Sleep on your earth and feel your hurts. Behold the maker of sight and sound as he sneezes and coughs and blows his nose. You wonder if I understand how you feel? Well, look into the dancing eyes of the kid in Nazareth. That's God walking to school. Ponder the toddler at Mary's table. That's God spilling his milk. You wonder how long my love will last? Find your answer on a splintered cross, on a craggy hill. That's me up there, your maker, your God, nail stabbed and bleeding, covered in spit and sin soaked. That's your sin I'm feeling. That's your death I'm dying. That's your resurrection I am living. That's how much I love you. Wow. Max Lucado has an amazing way with words. But you know what? He's talking about an even more amazing Savior. He's talking about an even more amazing love. Consider today, folks, begin to to comprehend, if you haven't thought about it before, the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of God's love in Christ. Think about it. It's a love that calls the God of the universe to come and to live our lives, to know what it's like to have a a cold or a sinus infection and to blow your nose. Quite frankly, frankly, it blows my mind. 
It's, it's a love that calls the one who spoke and galaxies spilled forth to limit himself to be a feeble child who spilled his milk. It's a love so great that God Himself, listen to this, would allow sinful men and sinful women to nail Him to a cross. It's a love so great that God would allow Himself, would hang there intentionally because He loved you and I and loves you and I still that much. Forsaken, soaked in blood, searing pain through His whole body, gasping to, to, bring, to draw air into His lungs. All because He loves you. And He loves me. Oh, see what love the Father has lavished upon us, folks, that we should be called children of God. And that is who we are. Do you see it? Do you feel it? Have you experienced it? Are you at least beginning to know its breadth and length and height and depth? Oh, I pray you have. You cannot fully comprehend Christ unless you just totally immerse yourself in His love. John MacArthur says, it must be the very root and ground of our being. You know, someone once asked Louis Armstrong to explain jazz, to which he reportedly answered, man, if I got to explain it to you, you ain't got it. Christ's love is like that. It must be experienced. Therefore, Paul prays that you and I will fully experience it so that we might love Christ and love one another more deeply. So you have an assignment there to make it our prayer. To make it our prayer for one another. If you're listening online, uh, you can get the assignment uh, on our webpage. But pray that we would be grounded in Christ's love. Pray that we would comprehend its breadth and length and height and depth. And pray that comprehending Christ's love, that that would compel us to more fully love Christ and others. Let's pray together. Lord, I, I don't have adequate words. I can't speak or draw a good enough picture of, of your great love. But Jesus did. He stretched out his arms and he died for each of us. Jesus came and became a, a small child, he, dependent totally on his mom and his dad. Because He loved us. You, God, came like that. You so loved us that You would limit Yourself and live our lives. Have colds and illnesses just like we have. God, Your love is amazing. And I just pray that more and more Your people gathered here, Your people who might be listening, Your beloved children around this globe would grasp what is the the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of your great love. That we'd just every day be grounded in that love. And Lord, I pray again that that love would then compel us to go out and to love others. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. close our worship today with a chorus called your love compels me please stand and sing with me we have the screen and we also have it on your handout
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you today and forevermore. Amen.